You are listening to Wonder Labs, filling your ear holes with nerdy goodness. Hello, and welcome to Wonder Labs. I'm Chris Richardson. And I'm Ellie Mackay. In this episode, we speak with Antea Lackier. Antea is a research fellow in the Irish Centre for Research and Applied Geosciences, or ICRAG. She has a background in research at Trinity College Dublin, where she was investigating fossil ammonoids in the Clare Basin in Western Ireland, and more recently has been working on the development of a training and outreach facility. We get into the importance of mollusks as an index and keystone species, the giant insects and trees of the Carboniferous period, and we revisit the story of revered fossilist and glass ceiling smasher Mary Anning. Antea is a fantastic voice not just for women in STEM, but also science more broadly. Her experience at the Nature Press Office and current outreach facility development are a testament to her ability to bring geology to the world in a fun and engaging way. As someone who loves fossils, this was a brilliantly nerdy discussion. We hope you enjoy it too. Antea, thanks for coming on the show. No worries, thanks for having me. Just to kick things off, if you could uh, tell us a bit about your background and uh, how you got into what you're doing currently. Okay, I'm originally from Italy. I studied classics in high school, then moved to Ireland to study geology at Mm. university. Then I was like, oh, geology is really nice, I'd like to study a little bit more. And so then I did a PhD in um, biostratigraphy, which means you're studying fossils, so ancient animals preserved in rocks. Mm -hmm. Then I ended up doing a master's in Imperial and doing a postdoc at the same time. Oh, fantastic. Right, quite a lot of things to juggle there then. Yeah. Fossils then, fossil ammonoids, that's your specific area of expertise. What are fossil ammonoids? So ammonoids are relatives of squid and cuttlefish, so things with tentacles that swim in the ocean. So they're still alive today, but ammonoids themselves are a group that are extinct. So Mm -hmm. they went extinct with the dinosaurs dinosaurs um, about 65 million years ago and they're really cool they get preserved in tiny tiny shells in rocks that you can find for example along the coast of Ireland where I did my PhD. Mm-hmm. So just to clarify, what's the difference between ammonite, ammonoid, or nautiloids or nautilus? Because those are all words that we've associating mm. with these seashells or mollusks of some kind. Yeah, so they're all mollusks and ammonites are a subset of ammonoids. And um, ammonites evolved towards the end, so in the Jurassic so towards mm-hmm. the end of their whole evolutionary time period, so with the dinosaurs. Ammonoids, usually we associate them um, with the wider grouping, so that includes, for example, goniotites and ceratites, so these are just Ooh. technical <laughs> terms. It's me all excited. <laughs> Get your fossils out. <laughs> subject yeah. and uh, cool. so these guys they ranged in size the ones I looked at were a few centimeters in diameter only whereas the ammonites of the dinosaur time were huge mm. they're all marine animals they're all mollusks and so just to give people a picture because mollusks people might be thinking of things like oysters snails. bivalves snails ammonoid or ammonite specifically is referring to the spiral shape Absolutely, isn't it? yes. So these are a bit like sea snails, would you say? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they had a lovely shell that mm. luckily gets preserved in rocks, and that's how we can then tell yeah. what species is which. And the really cool thing about these is that the the bumps and the grooves and the ridges on the surface, they're like de- clues that you can use as a detective to work out the time, the salinity, the temperature, the rate of growth. A bit like rings on a tree. Yeah, that's, right. that's what we have to work with. Yeah, they're really cool. <laughs> so you guys have spoken quite a bit there about the sort of distinction between different words and yeah. there's a lot of different morphological features, so physical differences between mm. them as well. How difficult is it to kind of classify between these these different things and what's the benefit of that? So it's quite difficult, I'm not going to lie. I spent maybe <laughs> two years trying to learn uh, how to identify these things. Mm. Uh, but really it's just differences in the patterns of lines on the shell so some had bumps some Mm. had spines so Mm. they're quite different and you can distinguish different species using this that can tell you the age of the rock if you know the species in the rock you can Mm. say okay they're 300 million years old then those rocks and geologists use that to tell where they are in the rock record for example Mm -hmm. yeah so they're really known as an index species aren't they Um, yes it's William Smith, I think. William Smith, yeah. What's an index species? 
So index species are species that you can use to tell you the age of a rock. So mm -hmm. they're quite valuable um, because they change morphologically. So in shape, in appearance, they change through time as they evolved. Got it. Yeah, they're, they're really yeah. helpful to geologists. Also sort of the, the phrase keystone species right. as well, being like an indicator species mm. where if that species is present, you know for sure that the certain environmental conditions or... existed or that the ecosystem is healthy or unhealthy mm. or had experienced some sort of environmental change. But then uh, ammonoid family and ammonites it's more that they are time index really. yeah exactly hmm. and also if we don't know if we're in the sea and we see an ammonite then that rock was deposited of in course the sea. Yeah, yeah it tells you the topography of the region as well how that's changed over time so this idea that uh, fossils of fish up in the in the himalaya will yeah. tell you about orogeny or mountain building processes that yeah happened. That's interesting, and I think the sort of time scales that you're describing, you know, sort of 65 yeah. <laughs> million years, people think about, you know, old, old things that exist in towns and cities and objects that they have, but this, this yeah. is just, a, you know, it's almost so inconceivable cool. scale, it's, it's just the vast endlessness of time itself, how do you, how do you get your head around that? So tricky. I remember um, some people use, um, so for example, our lecturers in college tried to equate it to a, in, a, in the blackboard, like a tiny little speck of chalk was the time humans were alive and then all mm. the way to the end was mm. the age of the earth. But there's um, one example is the clock. If, if all of time is 24 hours, yeah. then we've been around for the last two minutes, I think it is. It's maybe it, less, it, yeah. uh, and then sort of dinosaurs have appeared at 8 p.m. for example, and and you can work backwards through the clock that way. That's why I think it's so fascinating about geology because all of this this mountain building and de deposition sedimentation is happening on such a slow rate. Mm. But if you speed it up, it's the same as water flow, or you know, it has the same sort of properties as everyday materials. Mm. Yeah, you or the, sort of the see that in the ocean ridge and mm. that sort of rate of the rate of the fingernail growth. They say is the rate that the plates are yeah. spreading apart. So that's quite cool as well. It's quite fast, really. So that, <laughs> yeah. that brings you on then, I guess, to um, next question. This is all really fascinating. That vast endlessness of time itself <laughs> is just a baffling notion, and you really do appreciate our, our insignificance as a species in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> yeah. Why is this information valuable? What does that tell us? How does understanding ammonoids and these kind of processes that are occurring very slowly, um, how is that useful? So, well, geologists use it for a few different things. One reason is to study climate change in the past and then mm. related to the present. So sure. if we understand sea level change mm. and we can use ammonites and ammonoids to tell us about these intricate changes in sea level on maybe a hundred thousand year scale. Mm. Uh, if we understand that better and we understand glaciation better back 300 million years ago, then we can understand climate change today a little bit better, hopefully. Right. That's such a good answer. Yeah. I think that one of the main barriers to understanding or appreciating the um, level of climate change or the impacts of climate change and, of course, the anthropological impact or mm. the, you know, how much man is causing it is because humans look at things on a very human scale. And, of course, seasonally, yes, there are colder air it snaps and warm and so on. And this is the thing that people struggle with is proving how the climate change, because if you look in the last 50 years or 100 years or 1,000 years, um, that's a very different picture or different trend than 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 years. So these geological eras, these epochs, give us that huge scale which allows you to then mm. actually look at what are the major changes and trends that are occurring. And that data as well, because yeah. let's face it, we don't really have an yeah, abundance exactly, of the kind yeah. of you know, sophisticated tools that we have to measure different parameters. Yeah, so these no. index species yeah. you describe well, When they say, useful. oh, this is the, the hottest year in history, huh. they mean recorded history, uh -huh, which is uh -huh. really not very long to be useful for anything. No, uh, the ice cores don't go down very far. And yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's really good for that, geology in general. But mm. actually then some geologists don't really worry too much about climate change in a way because they think the planet will be fine. Mm. You know, humans <laughs> may die out, but... <laughs> because we are just that, yeah. that speck yeah. on a blackboard. Yeah. We are, we are, we are <laughs> We're so insignificant. Come and go, yeah. 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 yeah, interesting. Chris, do you know what the word ammonite or ammonoid, where it comes from? Is, is it the horns of um, horns Ammon? The, the yeah. God, what the god the Egyptian, Egyptian, Egyptian god, god Amun yeah. had a crown made of ram's horn. Thank us when you win your next pub quiz. Yeah, it's <laughs> good. Geology is full of really useful pub quiz pub facts. Quiz trivia, yeah. Yeah. Pub quiz trivia. Yeah, pub quiz trivia. Awesome. Fantastic. Talk about snake stones if you want as well. Oh, like, yeah. Because they were called snake stones, but people didn't know what they were. Or lightning bolts. Yeah, things. they had all sorts yeah, of names, weird. didn't they? Yeah. Right. And so I guess historically people would find these very distinctive 
snail shells and or, you know ram's horns in the rock and yeah. before they re- were really classified or mm. they knew the high level detail that we know now they they sort of had a bit of myth and legend behind them didn't they yes i think they used to carve little faces on the ends of them and it was looked like a snake with a little face at the mm. end mm. and mary anning so in lyme regis for yeah. example would find lots of these and so she was one of the pioneers but she knew more about mm. them than that mm. but yeah so let's let's delve into that quickly then before we move on as well i mm. mean this is this is the one thing in fossils i know something about so she she was a fossilist who took over the family business when her father passed away when she was quite young and mm. had quite a limited formal education but was just an you know incredible level of expertise that she built up over years and years of working with these fossils and from my understanding a lot of the prominent male scientists at the time uh, would often come down to, to Lyme Regis and acquire these incredible specimens at massively discounted rates and come and pop them in museums and name mm. newly discovered species after themselves and Mary Anning for, for a long time was sort of confined to the, the history books as the tongue twister she sells seashells on the seashore and I know that you know since then there's been a, a big kind of push and a resurgence in actually giving her the proper recognition that she deserves for that contribution mm. so now a lot of the star specimens at the natural, natural history, history museum, museum just down the road here in, in, in London yeah. are actually now named after her and yeah. giving her few, that recognition just a few hundred metres away from where we're sitting now <laughs> yeah I yeah. like that she went on field work with her dog the little yeah. dog is in the pictures yeah. and I think he got killed he did it. yeah, yeah. Um, over, over a really harsh <laughs> winter yeah, yeah. <laughs> because she, she was out there in sort of really incredibly harsh mm. conditions and yeah. Like, yeah, ba- battling through the seasons. I think winters were probably much harsher then as well. And yeah, dog dog passed away too. Mm. But clearly she paved the way for female geologists. You and I are both female geologists. And yes. actually there wasn't the gender difference that I was expecting at university. Mm. There were quite a lot of girls on my course. Did right. you find the same thing? Yeah, as, at an undergrad level there are. So we mm. had maybe half and half. It was mm. good. But then PhD, mm. Mm, a bit fewer. And <laughs> certainly postdoc, it's male dominated and academia and so on yeah mm. so it's very typical afterwards i find but, sure but, but you're still yeah, there i'm still so here <laughs> <laughs> fighting a good fight so to come come to where you're based then western mm. ireland carboniferous clare basin tell us a little bit about <laughs> that <iteration there>. yeah. <laughs> um yeah so, so i'm currently helping to develop a training center in west clare which is on the atlantic coast of ireland mm-hmm. a very remote area very uh, beautiful landscape lots of rocks and geologists love it so they go there mm. anyway why, why do they love it so first of all they can see rocks on maybe a 30 meter cliff scale mm. Mm. um so that's actually quite rare uh, in the yeah world. i think it's worth pointing out as well for non-geologists that exposed rock faces and not mm. a rock face that's covered in moss that's been exposed for a long time but like sort of freshly exposed rock face that is really rare and really special for geologists to the point that quite often the joke is if somebody is um you know cutting a new uh, road through a mountain mm. or something and there's a, a building site construction site if there's any cars parked on the side of the road on a weekend you know it's a geologist <laughs> yeah. who's pulled over on a side of a motorway <laughs> and clambered out to to look at this area that's been dug out um, because it exposes those layers of, of rock, which it, it's the depth and the layers that you need to get to. So there's mm. not that much you can tell from the surface geology, digging around under moss and so on. Okay. Of course, you can see topography and, and so on, but it, it's really trying to get the access to those those slices, that, that, yeah. you know, the, yeah. the cut out and the cut through that we want to see. So cliff faces are brilliant for that because oh. the, the sea is regularly yeah. taking away a fresh slice, at, you know, daily and constantly. Yeah. So it's exposing. You can go down every few weeks and you see a, a newly exposed layer of, uh, of rock. Yes, right. and those layers were laid down 300 million years ago, and so we're kind of mm. imagining... 300 million years now. Yeah. <laughs> how did that happen? You know, what system could have laid down all this sand, yeah. you know, that then yeah. solidified into layers? So that's yeah. what they're thinking about. So when they come to visit, then, what kind of things do they, do they see in this suppose, kind of cliff mm. face? So they're looking at things like sea level change, Mm -hmm. past glaciation, climate Mm. change in the rocks as well. Mm. So we're very lucky because we have a set of cores. So these are rocks drilled behind the sea cliffs. Um, So they're like a cylindrical slice of rock that's been Mm. drilled and then brought back up. And we can study that as well as the cliff face. And we can kind of compare and see Mm. how these ancient river systems were operating. So 
what happened really 300 million years ago was that Ireland was covered by the sea mm -hmm. and then gradually the sea level r lowered over time and right. you had river systems coming in and depositing a lot of sand and silt and mm. mud mm -hmm. and at the same time then you had changes in sea level due to glaciation mm -hmm. so you have animals that come in and populate the oceans so ammonoids for yeah. example. It's a fantastic illustration I guess just of this ability to see something for an entirely different lens because mm. you know for me mm. as a non-geologist when I look at a, a cliff face usually it's just a just oh that's a, that's a thing pile of rocks yeah exactly yeah. so I see a lot of rocks and it's quite yeah. homogenous I guess now now I'll be keeping an eye out and uh, yeah another thing that the idea of looking at through a geologist lens is is the ability to see colour where there is none and mm -hmm. this is a, yeah. a joke yeah. among geologists as well that you would look at rock and see grey <laughs> or white whereas we would see pale blue and purple and green yeah. and, and you'd mm. look at it and, and because the subtleties the slight tint and mm. tone of you know sand has so many different colours it's not just yellow yeah. um, that geologists are trained to spot those layers and those bands of, of browns and yellows really subtle distinctions yeah really subtle distinctions between the clays and the sandstones and the limestones and the sediments of those regions so just to set the seen then the Clare Basin is sedimentary you've mentioned we've got we've got shale we've got mudstone this is very um, almost like a river delta muddy swampy estuary type region of deposition yes and those sea level rising and falling and the glaciation rising and falling is what adds to those layers of deposition and then you mentioned 300 million years ago so this is the Carboniferous so we're talking before the dinosaurs aren't we oh yes way before so the dinosaurs came in in the Jurassic what was it about a hundred million years mm. or so so mm. yeah we we're talking way before that and people may know about the Carboniferous um, because it was quite famous for uh, giant insects you know um, dragonflies with like a meter long wingspan and giant millipedes and three foot cockroaches and so on is that true and also how did we have these giant insects I'm quite glad we mm. don't have them now <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I think I mean, the fossils tell us that it's true. So mm. in the sense, if we find a nice fossilized wing, a giant wing, then mm. we say, oh, yeah. But these giant insects then, what were the conditions like environmentally to enable the support of... The atmosphere was different at the time mm -hmm. and oxygen levels were different at mm -hmm. the time and probably that enabled... Much higher. Higher. Yeah. So you had these giant plants, giant trees mm. as well, which is... Great. And, and this was a time when the plant life would be very much um, ferns, seed ferns and, and leaves that had what's called strap leaves, so long and thin leaves as opposed to branching type leaves. So you can imagine the foliage that would have been around mm. and the animals that were around would have been reptiles and amphibians. Yeah, you've got these tetrapod-like mm. creatures, really. Um, so you have the the sort of colonization of land yeah. in the Devonian. Mm. Yeah. Oh, it's exciting. <laughs> so cool. Because well, this really was. This was a period of real change. It was 60 million years, but in geological time, that was actually quite fast. What mm. we call a radiation of species across onto the land. This was the first moment that fish grew legs and walked out of the ocean, essentially. Mm. Um, yes, it took six million years, and of course the evolutionary process is a long one, but a real, a real time of amazing change evolutionarily where creatures started to develop the amniotic egg and that allowed them to give birth on land, which then meant that they didn't have to return to sea to lay eggs. Phenomenal change, yeah. and that is all laid down in the fossil record. Yeah, you can see these changes in the rocks, which is amazing. I mean, sometimes you see a trackway of a tetrapod. Oh, so wow. It's just so cool. But... The rocks I'm looking at mainly they're ocean, you know, ocean laid down rocks. Uh -huh. So you have remains of fish, remains of fossil sea lilies. So oh, um, that's cool. crinoids. Yeah. They're really cool. They look like polo mints in the rock. Mm. They're like the yeah. cylinders. How amazing is it that that, that record got preserved? Because can you imagine if, you know, fossils didn't get preserved for some reason you know mm. imagine if, if calcite broke down and these shells didn't survive and we'd have no idea we wouldn't see these tracks and and how would we know how these fish you know became tetrapods and walked out of the ocean mm. I, I just think it's fascinating that such a dramatic changing period of history has such a phenomenally rich um, and detailed record I mean, it's more that there's more evidence for that than, mm. than than our current lives. You know, we a lot of our impact won't be as visible as as that. It's fantastic. Well, yeah. it, also, it also just validates, in a way, the theory of evolution too. Mm. Oh yeah. And, yeah. And to, until the point, you know, where we start to find contradictory fossils in the fossil record, mm. it seems to me like this validates the thinking in terms of where we came from as a species and mm. where other species have come from and the sort of time scale on which these mm. processes operate as well. Yeah, I mean, that's literally how we know it's from 
the fossils. I mean, mm. we don't, we wouldn't have any other way of knowing. We have no so clue otherwise. We probably don't know about many fossils that didn't get preserved. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But yeah, that's true. There must be things that I mean, all the soft tissue, soft body Star jellyfish just and things. Them to be perfectly yeah, preserved if they weren't preserved, preserved at all. we'd have no idea. Which is, what are all the things we've lost that we'll never know about? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> poor, poor little jellyfish from that's... the Carboniferous. <laughs> I okay, feel sad about those guys. <laughs> they've, they've, they've gone to become better things. Yeah. yeah. But I think it is worth thinking about when some... I mean, I'm a geologist, so obviously I don't believe this, but playing devil's advocate when some people say, oh, what's the point of studying a bunch of old rocks? Fossils, you man. know. Yeah. Um, and we've, we've had, um, you know, we've had discussions about black holes mm. and the universe and the Big Bang and the idea of the importance of finding out the origins of the universe, if not for any other reason than discovering our origin story mm. and how important mm. that is to know where we're from. Well, this is, I mean, we're still talking hundreds of million years, but it's even more recent than that. We're literally going back to the point at which human evolution began, or yeah. animal life began sure. from that primordial soup. So yeah. it really is amazing that you get to work every day with direct, tangible, touchable evidence yeah. of that process. Yeah, when you almost when you break open a rock and you're the first person to have seen that rock oh, wow, in 300 yeah. million years. That's really cool. Well, first person. So, <laughs> what am I saying? That was that was incredible. Yeah. When, when I was in my you know Jurassic Park um, obsession as a kid, I kind of remember sort of digging digging around in the garden to try and find things, and I think I did find just a, a snail shell mm. that, that I thought may have been older than it was, and was probably just <laughs> a snail from about a week ago. Yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. No, but you, you still got, had that got, sense of wonder, right, and amazement and curiosity. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the intricacies of um, what makes up a snail shell, indeed, it's yeah. Yeah, a similar kind of have you ever, morphology. Have you ever had a moment where you've found, where you've cracked open a rock and found a fossil and it's yeah. been amazing? Well, yeah, I once when I found a trilobite shell. Oh, trilobites. Everybody loves trilobites, I love trilobites. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, that's the only time I ever found one because they were quite rare, I think, yeah. in the Clare Basin, but um, that was exciting. Who's, who's the trilobite. famous trilobite author? There's a... Richard Forte. Uh, Richard Forte, yeah, that's right. That yeah. book is amazing. You read that one, yeah. Trilobite, so with yeah. an exclamation mark. Yeah. Of it. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's Add an exclamation mark. Yeah. 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 So much more exciting. That's how enthusiastic yeah. he is about them. Yeah. Trilobites are awesome. They're like sort of giant wood lice for anyone who's yeah. not yes. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Segmented uh, arthropod. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Very cool. So back to um, the Clare Basin, which is almost like this sort of mecca for geologists. Yes. I mean, there's, well, there's lots of places. Like <laughs> I love that as a tagline. <laughs> the mecca for the geologists. Mecca for geologists. <laughs> it is, it is. I mean, you have, you have Petra, which I'd say is the... Where would you say is the mecca for geologists? Claire, you, um, <laughs> there, are, there, are, there are regions, um, because as we said, it's an area where you get yeah. this exposure and there's so much uh, sedimentary history there because you've got the rise and fall and rise and fall and rise and fall, you've got all this flow and cycle yeah. of, of the sediment being deposited and the ice and the water action and the erosion and all that going on. Um, so it's this, it's this rich um, evolutionary history and sedimentary history there. Mm. It's very popular with geologists for studying um, everything that you've just talked about. It's also quite popular with industry as well, isn't it? Yes, it is. So people from academia, but also people from industry go to Clare. Mm. And they go because that particular system of rocks helps them understand other places in the world huh. uh, where there might be oil and gas. So although there isn't oil and gas today in Clare, there is in similar rocks deposited, mm, yeah. say, off the Gulf of Mexico, off Africa, for example. So mm. they go there and they understand how these depositional systems worked and that helps them in their exploration. So let's just talk a little bit about how specifically that does work. If you're a, somebody representative from the oil and gas industry and you go and stand on a beach in the Clare Basin and you see some sedimentary layers, how does that tell you that there's oil or gas in Mexico, for example? So they're looking at cliffs on a scale that they usually only see in seismic sections. So mm. usually uh, oil and gas industry representatives look at seismic lines uh, through the earth. Mm. Um, so they're looking at little patterns on a screen, on a, on a computer mm. screen. So vibration oh. or evidence, really, rather yes. than directly seeing it. Of yeah. different rock layers. Mm -hmm. And they kind of try to interpret them and think, oh, the oil could have migrated up and then it gets trapped. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we can find some oil or gas in this rock because mm -hmm. there's a trap, there's a structural a rock that's yeah. preventing it from escaping but, but that's still guesswork isn't it a lot it of the is. time yeah okay. oh absolutely because here we're looking at the the ground whereas right. uh, usually when they when people prospect for oil and gas they look offshore uh -huh. so mm -hmm. um, they're comparing to the Gulf of Mexico but to rocks that are way under the sea okay. mm, that's, okay, that's that kind of the, the difference right. so they're able to see in the rocks in Clare things that they wouldn't normally be able to see because they're under the sea mm. that's why they go there just in more detail how 
does looking at some sandstone tell you about climate change? So to simplify it a little bit, um, when you have a lot of sand, it's telling you that river systems were cutting down into the rocks, mm-hmm. eroding sand particles and depositing mm-hmm. them somewhere, mm-hmm. and then you've got all your sandstone. Whereas if you have a shale, you have very, very fine mud particles that just mm-hmm. slowly deposit and then solidify over a long period of time. Yeah, very mm-hmm. slow growing. And that's usually telling you that you had the ocean at the time. So mm-hmm. it's just an ocean and you have slow deposition. So if you see uh, an alternation of sandstone and shale, you can say, oh, the sea level must have changed. So the mm-hmm. sandstone is there when you have low sea level and the shale right. is there when you have high sea level. And maybe that's related to glaciation in the southern hemisphere. Mm-hmm. That's it's kind of detective and, work. And it's worth saying as well that you use this in conjunction with other evidence, for example, glacial evidence of um, you know the, the ice having, having torn and scratched away at mountainsides and seeing you know U-shaped valleys and things, classic mm. ice uh, sculpted landscapes. So you can tell when they were present or absent as to how much ice there was on the planet or not. You compare that to the sea level and say, well, that fall in sea level is because all the ice is stuck on the mm. land and then the rise in sea level is when the ice disappears. So you can relate that to melting. Yes, exactly, yes. So now your postdoc work, developing uh, geology training and outreach facilities in the the Clare Basin, is that right? That's right, yes. So I was always interested in science communication, science outreach throughout my PhD, Mm. and this postdoc kind of helps me to combine my two passions of geology and science communication. So we're hoping to develop training facilities for visiting geologists Mm. in Clare, so near the rocks, so people can Mm. move between the rock and maybe it might be raining they want to go inside they go inside Mm. they see cores there so we have the cores that were drilled as well Mm -hmm. um and um we have 12 boreholes that were drilled in the area just for research so it's just a hole behind the cliff faces where you get the rock out of so you get the core from it um and um these boreholes were drilled by statoil and ucd university college dublin and we have them now for research and for training Mm. so we can study them so you're literally building an on-site education facility Uh which is it's quite rare really it's like having um ancient egyptian studies at the pyramids (laughs) your your, your classroom being in the jungle or or on a a volcano okay now 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 i understand (laughs) now you want to go (laughs) now yeah and so what's what's the benefit of that why not just build um you know a clare basin outreach center in london for example Mm. because that's more accessible that's a good point but i think the whole idea behind this is that we want to have something for the local community right. as well right. so we want people in Clare to be able to visit the centre and understand maybe more about the mm. geology and also inform us so a lot of the work I've been doing is survey work trying to find out what people think about mm. geology um, and about these groups of visiting geologists mm. who have been coming since the 1950s so what's their idea yeah. of it? So that point then I mean the, the local community involvement is something I know that you're you're very keen to push how exactly are the local mm. community shaping the development of the centre? Up to now I've done the first sort of round of survey work and the local community are very pleased (laughs) I can Mm. say to have uh, the centre opening for instance it brings tourism into the area that's one reason and um, putting Claire on the map (laughs) also you know farmers would have allowed people to visit their land and gain access to the rocks for Mm. a long time so it's nice to give something back so so in your research then is because you've obviously been speaking with all these local stakeholders what was their impression of the Clare Basin before? Were they aware? I mean, do they love the Clare Basin for its geology? Are they proud <laughs> to be from Clare? Are they sort of proud like... Clarians. Yeah, do they know they're sitting on the, the mecca of geology? They, they know, but they... They, <laughs> they, they do know, but yeah. they see these groups come in and out yeah. and they're pleased and they think, oh yeah, there must be something to this. Yeah. Yeah. But then mm. uh, one of the questions that we ask in the survey is to imagine the ground under your feet and make a sketch. Okay. And so Oh, that's cool. We're getting some interesting <laughs> answers from that. Just people don't really think about it, I yeah. think. I suppose when it's your just backyard. Think about, think about it in London, it's just sort of like smelly tubes and yeah. crumpled newspapers. I dread to think what's under our feet at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Six different tube lines. Yeah. Yeah. But but that's interesting, though, that they your, if your backyard is some place of special scientific interest it can go sort of one of two ways you can either be really proud of it and interested in join the bandwagon and start selling rock cakes and you know (laughs) t-shirts and so on as people do in seashells on the seashell yeah exactly (laughs) Um, or they could go the other way and get off my land I'm sick of all these geologists poking around Mm. here and so on 
it's a delicate yeah delicate so balance. and you're basically mm. at the crux of that you are negotiating and navigating those conversations with the local community so how have you found that process well quite tricky and i'm learning as i go mm. uh, but my experience is kind of i'm doing field work in the area so they do know mm. me from just going and like mm. getting some rock samples so mm. i think just talking to people and keeping the dialogue going and mm. you know never assuming things and just keep them involved from the beginning which is mm. what has been done so far and there have been some concerns uh, because some companies wanted to do fracking in the area oh. a few years ago the f word yes <laughs> <laughs> so now in ireland there's a ban and nobody can really? do any fracking is there really yes okay. oh, i didn't know that yeah. so um luckily that's not a concern anymore yeah and that kind of helps it helps with regaining trust so yeah. was that just sort of brought trust. in by the government or was that as a result of a petition did people speak out how did that come about What's there the were lots of protests um okay. in local community groups coming together huh. um websites i don't know media facebook mm, that mm, kind of yeah. thing but um oh. then the government put a ban on they, it yes. they listened yes right. that's very cool where mm. do you see your role are you more strongly affiliated with the sort of oil and gas industry who sponsor a lot of these projects are you more on the side of the community who've taken you in and look after you or are you completely independent I suppose my own affiliation is with um, academia and universities, mm. so I'm in the Irish Centre for Research in Applied Geosciences, ICRAG in yeah. UCD. I love that it's called ICRAG. It's, <laughs> can we, can we, can it's we just, can we, can we just run there. down uh, ICRAG? Can you explain that for us? <laughs> so ICRAG is a <laughs> research centre um, <laughs> where we have all sorts of applied geology being done. So we're interested in the public perception and understanding of geoscience. Mm. So mm-hmm. that's kind of where I'm coming at it from. Mm. But of course we are tied to oil companies as well and mm. without Stat Oil and other oil companies, we wouldn't have been able to drill these boreholes yeah. that yeah. gave us so much valuable information. If you do see that you know, XYZ Oil Company is now investing in whatever initiative for education, mm-hmm. is your response cynical or is your response like, oh, great, that's good that they're doing that? <laughs> <laughs> well, just this morning I was walking down South Kensington to uh, the mm-hmm. walkway and there's an exhibition in the Science Museum with yes. Stat Oil. Yes, mm. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> I don't know. I, I have mixed feelings about it. I do think that it would lead people to have an initial kind of mistrust, mm-hmm. an initial jerk reaction. You know, they're probably coming from the right place. Having had a PhD funded by an oil company, I can't, you know, mm. I, I have to acknowledge that <laughs> it can be great uh, yeah. to have their interest and they can fund pure research. So I don't know, it's really tricky one. Sure. That was, that was yeah. very diplomatic. I like that. I think for me, it's sort of an equivalent problem to charitable work in the yes. sense in the sense that if I commit a charitable act and do something good mm. the cynic will always say well mm. it's not truly altruistic it's not truly mm. selfless because you feel good about having done it there will always be a benefit to doing these things for the companies yeah. and we just have to accept that that is an inevitable uh, byproduct and, yeah. and that's, that's okay it doesn't have to be zero sum and maybe we need this to move away idea. from you know anti-capitalist sort of uh-huh. hatred and yeah. this rhetoric of corporations being against human benefit and because mm. otherwise how do you catch a break Absolutely. I mean, we, do we have, we've got to give these guys a we, break at some point because they're doing their best so well you yeah. need people yeah. in those corporations who care about mm. the environment who mm. care about people and local yeah. communities and I think there are the, this project going back to the Clare Basin this educational outreach centre sounds like it's a really fulfilling promising project that's coming Mm. about yeah it's very exciting and it's all about education it's all Mm. about research academia and just understanding these rocks ultimately so i think initially we're going to go out to schools in the local area and do some workshops maybe some fossil digging workshops things like that which we run in icrag anyway Mm. and then from there get the word in and yeah hopefully have schools fantastic so watch this space everybody so i just wanted to ask you then this is not a sort of a traditional route that a geologist would take to Mm. find themselves implementing a a local community outreach centre. How are you finding this process on a personal level? I love the freedom that I have as a postdoc to be able to sort of decide what research uh, Mm -hmm. direction to take and the public perception and understanding side. I really love that because it ties into science communication, the masters that I'm studying in Imperial as well and then hopefully down the line I'll be able to work in science communication and it may be that it's related to museums, to geology Mm -hmm. museums Mm -hmm. but also being able to be outdoors and talking to people is good. (sighs) Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's something that I think, well, certainly myself and probably many of our listeners mm. <laughs> can relate to. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Sounds like you've got a dream job. <laughs> yeah, looking forward to more big things. Fantastic, thank, thank you. you very thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so just to finish off, we've got a quick fire round, some rapid questions for you. <laughs> First one is, if you weren't doing what you're doing, what would you be doing instead? 
I always wanted to travel and work with animals, so oh. zookeeper. You kind of do that now. Somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They just, they're they're just yeah. dead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now thinking of like an ammonite filled zoo. Or it'd just be cuttlefish, wouldn't it? Giant zoo, zoo full of shrimp. around everywhere, <laughs> freaking everybody out. <laughs> Big shrimpy zoo. Be awesome. Shrimpy zoo. That sounds terrible. <laughs> Shrimpy zoo sounds amazing. No, it's Is good. that just because we're geologists? We think that would be cool. Yes. <laughs> Shrimpy zoo. Zookeeper. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, or Travel, traveling yeah, or vest, traveling vest. <laughs> so it's the, it's travel and outdoors and yeah. And yeah. animals. That's so, a common theme. Yeah, yeah. I like that. very yeah. cool. Which emerging field or technology? Uh, are you most excited about? Ooh, um, anti-aging therapies. Yeah, regenerative medicine. I don't want to kind of grow old. I want so you want to, when you're around. fossilized, you in sixty million years, <laughs> you want to be perfectly preserved. I want all the line, like all the grooves. Yeah. <laughs> Mount Rushmore, but with an- anterior spaces. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not as giant as Mount Rushmore. But. So anti-aging. What what makes you say that? Because that sort of came straight to you, didn't it? <laughs> it did, and I don't know. Like it's not something I think about a lot. But <laughs> I think about time and. Just Logical time mm. made me think about this. I suppose, yeah, yeah you, you work on fast change and so yeah. trying to slow down or, or alter that process. Yeah, have some more time to read and like oh, read so some much. books. And, yeah. and then, then, you, then you could be a travelling zookeeper and do all those yeah. other things that you want to do <laughs> exactly. rather than having to pick and choose with yeah. the finite amount of time that we have. Yeah. I'm with you on that. What is the one science topic that comes to mind that you think is frustratingly misunderstood? The first one was vaccines that I thought, but uh, mm. I, it's not that I constantly have to explain it, but it is frustrating. Sure. Um, maybe climate change, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. bit of it's great. Do you come up against a lot of sceptics or deniers when it comes to climate change? Are you having to justify climate change a lot? or Not so many. Um, just conferences, you do get the occasional question about mm. questioning your whole research and like, how do you know these rocks are so old? And, um... <laughs> that kind of worms again. <laughs> yeah. Um, we spoke a bit about your academic background, but probing sort of a little bit further into the past, do you remember a particular moment growing up where you were first captivated by science or by geology specifically? Growing up, I used to go gold panning a lot in the rivers in Italy, mm. so I think Amazing. that may have sparked an interest in what's yeah. in the room ground. <laughs> Did you find much? Yeah, so there are little specks of gold. <laughs> I'm rich now. Yes, no. 500 <laughs> tons of gold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So all the rivers in Northern Italy have a tiny bit of gold, gold so spec. it's quite fun. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Do you still have any of it now? I do, it. yeah. They have gold panning championships every year, so you can actually go. No way. Yeah, yeah. Don't tell us you're some sort of gold panning champion. I was on the Italian national team. Yeah. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. That is such a great fact. <laughs> yeah. You were on the Italian national gold panning championship team. I was. We didn't win, but yeah. I mean, this is incredible. But if I wasn't doing what I was doing and now, I'd, I'd be a travelling zookeeper. <laughs> Just got all this the is talents. amazing. <laughs> Why did you not open the podcast with that fact? Yeah, <laughs> we could wow. have been talking about gold panning. So what well, makes a gold panning champion? So you by, have to by being be... better at panning than everyone. So particular yeah. sh- sh- shimmy, a little shimmy? gold hand shimmy. To yeah, it. there's a whole movement to it. You have to be the fastest <laughs> and incredible. find all the gold. It's amazing. <laughs> blows my mind i think we're gonna to have to get you back on to a whole separate podcast i wish you didn't have a flight to catch because yeah, i want to know come back. can you teach us the, the yeah all in the wrist action yeah, the, yeah we can do a little competition yeah incredible so are you really good at legoland at the gold, gold panning activity <laughs> legoland done that. oh you gotta do that have you done that it's right. amazing that's the only reason i go to legoland i steal friends children and go there because you can do oh, a little really? gold panning and once oh. you've collected a certain number of ounces of gold you can switch it for a lego oh. no just me no. okay yeah, let's move fine. on so <laughs> Do you have a favourite piece of, well, we say lab equipment normally, but do you have a favourite piece of field equipment? Mm, well, it'd be obvious and say my geological hammer and my chisel. Mm. The chisel may be more important than the hammer. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that? You have to get into the shale, so the mud, and without a chisel, the hammer is useless. So there's a little mm, tip, always enough. bring a chisel. Yeah. And just on that point, what do you use for scale? Oh, in pictures. Yeah. We have like a person usually. So oh, yeah. can, you, can you just yeah. explain that for us again? What, what, what does that mean? Sometimes if you're showing a picture of a rock, you need something to show the scale Got it. in the picture, in the photo. So you might have a person standing there looking at the rock or you might mm. have your hammer. Or so they pull funny faces depends. or strike yeah, funny Yeah, usually. Yeah. So, so on a certain, obviously smaller scale, you'd yeah. use quite commonly is to use like a pen lid or a 50 pence piece. Yes, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or a camera lens because you've always got it with you for every mm. photograph. And so every geology 
psychologist has sort of like something in their pocket <laughs> that they use as their scale. Yeah. So you work with big scale, so you use people. If it's small scale, I'd use a little ruler mm-hmm. and just like have a white ruler so you can see it against mm-hmm. the black rocks. I suppose yeah. if you didn't have an assistant with you as well, you could just pop your camera on timer and quickly leg it just over to the cliff and leap jump in for in. a selfie. Yeah. <laughs> a cliffy. Cliffy. A cliffy. Cliffy. Yeah. Well, we'll get back. We'll get back to that one. <laughs> so I know. I know you've probably got an entire repertoire to choose from. But do you have a favourite geology joke? <laughs> oh dear. Oh, oh so dear. many. Um, I really like the one that has a picture of a volcano, uh-huh. and you say, "I lava you," and then you have another volcano saying, "That's nice," and it's G N E I W S. Wow, it's nice is a type of rock. Yeah. So right, got it. Yeah. I like that one. And geology rocks. Yeah, and geology rocks is always good. Yeah. Excellent, Andrea. Thank you so much. It's it's been a blast. Thank Fantastic. you. Thank you. Thanks very much. You are listening to Wonder Labs, fossilizing your seashells with petrified woodness. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. I love that you changed goodness for woodness. <laughs> <laughs>